Well, we are in week two of a series that we've entitled Triggered. I know some of you, you watch that bumper and you're like, that kind of triggers me right there. Don't text like those words that we just saw. Don't do that. Don't do that. But in this series, what we're talking about, we're going to be talking and dealing with offense. We're going to be dealing with anger. We're going to be dealing with things that we may be feeling and internalizing inside. So today in week two, we're going to be talking about, you know, those people. Not, not us. Not us. We're talking about those people. Those people. They're crazy. We live in a crazy world. Their thoughts, the way that they react to things. Last night, we closed up our weekend celebration of our anniversary. We went to a classic rock concert in Tampa. We went, Elaine and I, to Ario Speedwagon and Sticks. And I know a lot, just pray for me. You know, some of you are like judging me. Just pray, don't judge. But so many memories, you know, kind of takes you back to that moment in time. Well, as we were watching, it was taking a lot of people literally back to that time. We're just sitting there on the lawn, you know, kind of boun bouncing up and down. Yeah. Babe, I love you, you know. But the people around us, they're getting up and they're like, oh. <laughs> and halfway through the concert, there, there was this, this scent <laughs> in the air. I look at every lane, she's like, oh. And she goes, do I smell like weed? I'm like, no, you, don't, you smell great, babe. And, to, and I'm looking around, I'm like, these people are like our age. They're our age. And they're over there smoking weed, getting drunk. Halfway through, the guy next to us, <laughs> classic. I love the short, chubby guy with the hairy chest with the shirt all the way unbuttoned. <laughs> Halfway through, he's doing... And then he goes to sit down and he misses his seat by three feet. <laughs> Those people were crazy last night. But let me, let me go a little further. Those people. What do I mean by those people? You know, they, we all have those people in our life. Those people, the, the critical people that no matter what you do, they criticize everything. Or those controlling people, they got to tell you every single thing to do and how to raise your kids and how to react to every, you know, you know those people. Arrogant, sometimes mean. Those people that know everything about everything. Those people out there. You know those people, when you go online, and they're writing these messages in all caps. When you read an email or a message, I just wanna give you a tip. When you use all caps, that means you're yelling at me. So don't send me an email. Sometimes I get emails, they're like, Pastor, I know your heart, but, and then it's like this all cap email where they're yelling at me. You know those people where they, they constantly are gossiping and spreading rumors in the office. Or, you know those people, when you, you have a large family gathering or there's a family reunion, everybody's getting together, and it seems to be good, go, just going so well. And there's that one person that's gotta ruin it all to bring negativity up or to bring past hurts up or to say something out of hand or to say something about this person or that person. You know those people, the fam family gatherings? To, do, do you not have those people? Wait, if you don't have those people, you might be that people, okay? <laughs> so today we're gonna be talking about how do we deal in our hearts as believers in Jesus Christ, living our word, lives according to the word of God, how do we deal with those people all around us? Can we pray? Father, we just pray today that you would anoint these words, anoint your word, 
Father, your word is a light unto our path. It's a lamp unto our feet. So I pray, God, that you would light our path brightly today as we go deeply into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanna welcome all those that are watching online with us. We're so glad that you've joined us today, whether it's live or on the replay. If this is your first time here at Countryside, we want you to know that you matter here at Countryside. You walk through these doors, we want you to feel three things. You matter. No matter where you've come from in your life, no matter what your past, no matter where you've been, you belong at Countryside. And there's a place for you and your giftings to be used here as we join together as the family of God. So let's welcome all of our guests and all those that are watching online with us today. So as followers of Jesus, we're called to love people. Not select groups of people, we're called to love all people. We're called to even love those people. Let me tell you, it's, it's more difficult to love those people in this world than it's ever been in my lifetime. There is so much tension and stress in the world today. The things that people are going through and the things that they're processing. And over these last few years, it's like everyone's living on the edge. And just the most small thing will set someone off unlike anything that I've ever seen before. Maybe today you find yourself frustrated, disappointed, even angry with those people. But we're gonna look at a section of scripture that is so important. It was written by the Apostle Paul, and he's given instruction on something that is so very important that we need to look at, but not just read it, but apply it to our lives every single day. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna read this section of scripture, and then we're gonna come back to it, and we're gonna go verse by verse through that and glean what God wants to speak to us today. Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse 26 says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up to their needs, and it may benefit those who listen. Verse 31, very important, get rid of all Everyone say all. Not, not some, not when it's convenient, not when you wanna pick out the thing you're willing to give up, but it says get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. And here's the solution. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. Let's look at this and apply it to our lives. What is this section of scripture really saying? Let's dive in deep today. Verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. It says in anger, don't sin, which implies to us it's not a sin to be angry. That's not the sin, but what are we gonna do with that anger that may stir inside of our hearts, and how is that gonna come out of us as we process the anger that's inside of us? Here's the good news today. If you find yourself angry, you're normal. You see, you go out anywhere today and you interact with people, it's a test. You go online and you see what people are saying, it's a test. Watch the news for more than three minutes. You wanna get offended? Turn it on. Any news station, turn it, it's all bad news and it's offensive. And if that's what you're constantly doing, you're more than likely to become angry, which is normal. There's nothing wrong with that emotion, it's real. And I could get up here and say, that's not real, you should never get, no. In life, we are going to have anger, but here's the deal, what are you gonna do with that anger? You see, there's no winning in living offended. 
Our lives are never better because we're mad or because we're offended. Our marriage is never in a better place when we're mad and offended with our spouse. We're never in a more peaceful place. We're never in a more joyful place when we're offended and living in that place. So in your notes, this is important. Being offended is inevitable for all of us, but living offended is a choice. Every day when we get up out of bed, when I look at the clock and it's time to get up, I'm already offended. I get offended with my alarm clock. It's offensive to me. And I have a choice to walk out that day mad or at peace and loving with those that are around me. You see, you're gonna get offended in this life, but you don't have to live offended. Choose how you're gonna live day in and day out when you get up in the morning. The Apostle Paul goes on here, and he says, be careful. Very rarely will you see in Scripture where it says, listen, you, you gotta be careful. Don't hold on to your anger. Don't nurture the offense. Don't rehearse it in your hearts. And so many times, that's where the enemy wants us to be, in our heads, rehearsing those negative thoughts and those hurtful feelings. I don't know about you, but for me, for many years, when I would mow my lawn, I don't know what it was when I would mow my lawn, but I'd pull that thing and I would start mowing and I would start thinking of areas that people made me mad. I can't, I can't believe they said that. I mean, let me tell you, I was doing straight lines. I'm really big on my straight lines. I'm edging that. As I'm doing all this, I should be feeling good. But by the end of me mowing the lawn with all of those negative thoughts and offended feelings, I was mad. And oftentimes, I would come in and I would chew out someone around me because I was upset and I allowed the anger and the offense to stir in my heart and in my mind. Listen. When you allow that to happen, what you are literally doing is you're giving the devil himself, Satan, the father of lies, the prince of darkness, you're giving him what scripture calls a foothold in your life. A foothold, what is a foothold? The word foothold in the original Greek is topos. It means a place, a room, so if you live offended and angry, you're giving the devil a room, an actual place in your heart to do great work of offense and hurt inside of you. I don't know about you, I don't wanna give the devil any room in my life. I don't wanna give the devil a foothold in my marriage. My marriage is too important to me. I can't be offended and allow the enemy to get a foothold so that he can divide my spouse and myself. I don't wanna give him a foothold with my children. I don't wanna give him a foothold with my grandchildren. But when you live offended and you live angry, that's exactly what you're allowing the enemy to do. The Bible says you're giving the enemy a foothold to have access to every area of your life. So as I was preparing this message, I kind of was just thinking, if the devil got some demons together and they had a strategy session, the devil and the, and the demons were talking and they had a session where they came up with a strategy on what they can do to break the heart of God and to destroy the one that God loves most, his children. And today I wanna to give you three things that I think would have come out of that strategy session pitched from the pit of hell to us. Number one, the three Ds of destruction, I believe that the enemy wants to divide families, friends, and churches. Listen, it's easier than ever to be divided on politics, racial division, whether you're vaccinated, whether you're not vaccinated, whether you wear a mask, whether you don't wear a mask, that's just a foothold that the enemy can do. I am mad, I, I cannot believe you didn't get vaccinated. <laughs> and he's got division, and his heart is to destroy families, 
and cause family members not to talk, to ruin marriages, and to split churches. The enemy wants to do anything in his power to split every church in the world. And the thing is, what he does is he takes stupid little things that don't even matter, and he uses it to bring division. You see, a united church is unstoppable. It's absolutely unstoppable. Countryside, God's doing a great work in this church. Yesterday, we had nearly 400 people here for our Still the One Marriage Conference of people saying, man, I'm standing for my marriage. We're gonna build it together strong. The enemy's not happy about that. Do you know how many churches are divided because of the carpet color? And I know a lot of you look at this carpet in here. I hate it, too. But it costs a lot of money. We'll change it out. Don't worry. I didn't pick this out. I hate it. But are you going to allow little things constantly to come in and bring division between us? Because, church, we have an enemy that we really need to get mad at, we need to fight, and our enemy is not each other. We need to look after each other. We need to have each other's back. Do you realize there's people that get upset with me sometimes that I'm wearing sneakers on stage? In fact, I caused a big stir a few weeks ago. This is a big stir. Many of you may remember that I wore a pair of jeans that the knees were torn. How many remember that day? Oh, there's a few of you. Oh, yeah. Oh, it caused a stir. I could see it. People are like, nice jeans. In fact, I had a, a gentleman come in, and as he was leaving, he gave me a Pentecostal handshake. Pastors love Pentecostal handshakes. What a Pentecostal handshake is, is a handshake and then you realize, oh, there's money in this handshake. And it was so beautiful. He handed me this money, he leaned over, he said, buy some pants that don't have holes in them. <laughs> Guess what I bought last night? I'll see them next week, some black jeans with no holes in them, okay? <laughs> But when we look at some of the silly things that divide us, let's begin to look at the things that unite us, the things that we have the common goal of, to push the gospel further, to look at the heart of God as the gospel, the truth of forgiveness and redemption and the healing and redemption and forgiveness of sins. We got a message to give the world, but the enemy wants to divide us Divide our families, divide our friends, and divide our church. Number two, another D of destruction is the enemy wants to distract Christians from their mission. Oh, I tell you what, let's just get them mad at culture. Hey, you know what? If we can get them focusing on boycotting this, boycotting that. Oh, I, they're talking about, all they talk about is how much they hate the sin of the world. It's horrible. Oh, let's I tell you what, let's complain about the Netflix. Series. I hate that show. I can't believe that. And then what we begin to do is all we can focus on is all this bad stuff around us. The world is a sinful place. It's a dark place. And it's up to us to focus on our mission. The mission of God for us is to reach people with the gospel message. To love the Lord God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And to love people right where they are. People that come in here, I see it every week, there's people you know, they are right in the middle of a sinful lifestyle, but yet, here they are. And what they're gonna get from Countryside, this is my prayer, is that they're gonna walk in and that they feel loved, they feel accepted, and they feel like they can be part of the family of God, no matter where they've come from. Here they are. Getting mad? Oh! I can't believe you're wearing flip-flops. Flip-flops. Praise God for those flip-flops. I can't believe you're smoking in the front. You know, Pastor Lloyd, you know what he always said? He said, if you walk out of a church and there's cigarette butts, we're reaching the right people in Jesus' name. 
But we can get caught up in all the things because they're not like us. Those people, but those people are our mission to reach for the cause of Christ. That's our mission is to reach them with the gospel message. And yelling at them, getting mad at them, and boycotting them over every little thing is not gonna do anything to make them feel loved, cared for, so that they would be open to hear the gospel message. Are you okay? You st everybody all right? Number three. What the enemy wants to do is he wants to discredit our witness. So what he'll do is focus on what you're against. Let's get them arguing. Let's get them mad about this or mad about that. You see, the enemy's goal is to keep us angry, critical, judgmental, hypocritical, self-centered, self-righteous, easily offended, and mad at the world. A statement I make all the time is, do I like this culture? I don't. I don't like this culture. I don't like what they stand for. I don't, know what they, I don't like what they believe in. I don't like the way that they live. I don't like the way that they talk. But God's placed me right now, right in the middle of this culture. And he's called us as a church to effectively reach this culture with the name of Jesus Christ. Because of all times in history, this could be the most challenging time, but God's called us, church, for this time. He didn't call the people in the 80s. He called us for this time, for such a time as this. So let's do the work of the gospel and love the people around us. You see, it's not just in the world. Tragically, we're seeing anger, outward anger, seeping into our homes, living in a toxic environment in our homes and with our families. We're seeing family members, people inside the body of Christ that are living lives that are unloving and hurtful when we should be the ones that are most loving. I don't want you to miss this part of the verse in verse 26. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. How many of us, we get so mad and we go to sleep and we're miserable because we're so angry. What if we lived a life where we resolved every offense before the sun went down? You see in your notes, it says the day of your hurt should also be the day of your healing. The day that you get wounded, that should be the day. Elaine's real big on this. There's times I'm like, let's just go to bed. She, I don't wanna go to bed until we talk. I don't feel like talking. I'm talked out, I'm tired. No, we need to be at peace. And we're gonna stay up until we get this thing resolved. Imagine how different friendships would be, marriages would be, families would be, if in the same day that we got offended with one another, it was the same day that we said, I'm sorry. For some of us, those are the most difficult words to say. I am sorry. I want you to know, I say I'm sorry to at least five people every single week. Pastor, I'm, I, people say, Pastor, I'll just say I'm sorry. Have you ever seen that? How many remember Happy Days? I love a Happy Days. Great show. Well, there was a guy by the name of Fonzie. He was Mr. Cool, cool guy. Well, there's an episode where Fonzie really offended Richie. And he did a wrong thing. And he's trying to resolve it. And he says, Rich, I'm so I'm I'm sued. Wait, and he stops, he goes, <laughs> tries to get it together. Richie, I am sir. I was, he couldn't even say the words. How many of us have a hard time just stopping and bringing healing words? Sometimes I'm sorry diffuses it all. The times that, we, that we're wrong, that we, we say that we're wrong. Will you please forgive me for the areas that I brought hurt? Forgive me. I'm just a, a human being. It stinks that we're all just human beings and we let each other down. 
But when we begin to be gracious and forgiving and loving and we don't let the sun go down on our anger, it begins to change every area of our life. You see, the enemy wants an easy access to distract and to cause a lasting division in every area of our life and he will use offense, he'll use disappointment, he'll use a hurt to divide and to get a foothold in our lives. Verse 29 of Ephesians 4 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for the building up of others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't let any unwholesome talk, any belittling, no bad mouthing, no gossip. Well, it, it's just a prayer need, Pastor. It's a, it's a need, prayer need. You know when you're gossiping. No criticizing. No name calling. Only what's helpful in building one another up to encourage, to be a blessing to those around us. You begin to walk that out every day, guess what? You become a person of influence, you become a leader, because everyone wants to be around someone that's living a life encouraging other people, building up those around them, and not belittling them, criticizing them, mocking them, and tearing them down. Everyone wants to be around an encourager. So here's some good rules I've got in your notes. Some good, good rules to live by even when you're in conflict with someone in your life. Number one, never call names. You know, our words are powerful. Sometimes we call, we will say a name and it's like right when it leaves our mouth, we, we try to grab it, oh no, I didn't mean to say that. But once you call someone an idiot, they're always gonna feel like you think that they are an idiot, even if it was just in a moment. Oh, that person's dumb. They're always gonna feel that they're dumb. This person's bad. Oh, they're so annoying. When you call names, it's our hurt and it destroys. Our words matter. Number two, never raise your voice. I remember when Elaine and I got married. You, you see it when I'm preaching. When I get passionate about something, I get a little bit loud. I get a little bit fired up. I'm not yelling at you. I'm just excited about what I'm saying. Elaine's like, why are you yelling at me? I'm like, I'm not yelling at you. <laughs> well, it sure feels like you're yelling at me. So I wanna encourage everyone, watch your tone. Your tone matters. You can say the nicest thing, but if you say it loud and you're yelling it, you're a wonderful boss. <laughs> He's not gonna receive that really well. <laughs> Next thing, never get hysterical. I know maybe you read that and you thought hysterical. Don't get hysterical or historical. Don't go back in time and, and show all the past wrongs. You know, when you forgive, you let go. Never say never or always. You're always late. You're never on time. No, I was late like three times this year. That's not always. It's not never. When you're married, never threaten divorce. Don't throw that word out there. That's not even something you wanna talk about. And the most important is the last one here. Never quote your pastor when you're in a fight. <laughs> I've had people, they say, hey, I told my husband what you said. I'm like, thank you for that. I'll probably never see your husband again. <laughs> Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Only what is helpful in building others up. Maybe you're, de you're tempted to defend your anger. A lot of people are, especially in the church. I'm mad and I have a right to be mad. It's a righteous anger. And they live that way, mad at something all the time. Why, do we call, why don't we call any other force that's destructive righteous? We call it a righteous anger, but you never hear someone say, hey, I have a righteous greed. I want that, I'm gonna buy that, I'm gonna charge up everything because I want it, I deserve it, and I'm righteously greedy. No one ever says, I have a righteous lust. Oh, I looked at that woman in the wrong way. Praise be the Lord. <laughs> no one ever says, I have a, a righteous gluttony. 
I ate it all for the glory of God. No one, no one ever says those things, but yet we so quickly will say, I have a righteous anger. So what do we do with our anger? What do we do with it? Ephesians 4.31, it says this, get rid of all bitterness. All of it. Look in your heart, get rid of all of it. Rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with any other form of malice. We go on to verse 32, and it, verse 32, it doesn't say, be arrogant about your moral superiority. It doesn't say, be critical of everyone who thinks differently than you. It doesn't say, be harsh with those people because they're a bunch of idiots anyway. It doesn't say any of those things in scripture. This is what it says. This is the answer to everything that you may be offended with. This is God's answer. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. So how are we kind? How are we considerate? How are we compassionate? It's easy to do it from a distance. And so many people, they, as the body of Christ, it's, it's really easy to do it from a distance. Hey, I love you, glory be to God. We'll see you next week. Praying for you. But it's much more difficult. But this is what shows real kindness is when you're face to face and you're up close and you're looking at each other face to face, and you're saying, I forgive you, and you're saying, I'm sorry. You're actually in close proximity. See, one of today's challenges in the church at large is it's really easy to come and go, love you, you're great, there's a place for you, countryside, we'll see you next week, but it's easy to shout a truth from a distance. But to love someone up close, to really be involved in their life, to really show and engage in conversation where you're living out the scripture that says that you're slow to speak and really you are quick to listen. And people see that you're slow to become angry. To get in someone else's world, to get out of our own world, to understand their hurts, their disappointments, their fears, and to have compassion and care instead of forfeiting the right by being mad about everything that they may stand for. Church, we're better than that. That's why we wanna see people in groups doing life together, to get close, to listen, to hear, and to love, and to truly be kind and compassionate. So let's stop shouting it from a distance, and let's get together and really love. You know, as I was preparing this message, I, I thought of an acquaintance of mine. This guy, I don't know him well, but I know him. And he is one of those people. This guy's always right about everything. He's right about how to run a church, and he's not even a pastor, and he's not even involved in a church, but he knows how to run the church. You need to do this, Glenn, you need to do that. He's got the perfect theology, every area. He knows every detail of everything in theology, and it's all right and it's all perfect. Isn't that amazing? He knows how to spend his money. He'll tell you how to raise your kids. He knows everything wrong in the government, and he knows the total truth about COVID-19. <laughs> all of his sources are right, every one of them. And as I was thinking about this guy, I thought, that guy is hard to love. He is one of those people that drive me crazy. And I thought about it. And it kind of hit me. What if I'm one of those people? I'm up here preaching to you every single week. I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm training you in the word of God and in the scriptures. But let me tell you, last week after the message, I went home and I looked in the mirror and I said, good word, Pastor Glenn. I hope you received that. What if I'm one of those people? What if I'm one of those people that's prideful, arrogant, judgmental, and I begin to look, God, 
I want you to do a deep work in the core of my being. And I begin to pray a scripture in, in Psalm chapter 139. I, I want to, this is a challenging scripture, but I want to encourage our church, pray this over your life and over your heart. It says, search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If we begin to pray that over our lives and then begin to cry out to God, God, show me the areas in my life where I'm arrogant, where I'm judgmental, self-deceived. God, show me the areas in my heart where I'm harboring anger and resentment, carrying an offense. God, help me. I can only do this with the help of the Lord. Help me get rid of all anger, malice, slander, unforgiveness. Show me areas where I'm not kind and I'm not compassionate with those around me because God, I do not want the enemy to have a foothold and access to any area of my life. I don't want him to have access to my wife, my family, my kids, my friends, my church because that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He wants you to be mad. He wants you to be offended so that he can destroy and divide every area of your life. So how's that working for us? Because every minute that we live our lives where we're angry, we're offended, we're hurt, is a minute that we lose joy, peace, the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others, because ultimately in our lives, the last point, being offended is inevitable, but living unoffended is a choice. It's a choice that every single one of us have to make every day when we wake up. Are we gonna live our lives with the compassion of the Lord? Are we gonna live our lives with the love of Christ exuding to those around us? Are we gonna forgive our family, our spouse, our friends, church people? Because when we begin to do that, unity comes. A unified family, a unified marriage, a unified church. And when we're unified countryside, there is nothing gonna hold us back from the mission that God's called us to walk arm in arm with. To see a lost and a dying world come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. To turn what was dark into, to, into the light, into his glorious light. To truly be the light of the world is what God's called us to be. So let this be a day where we lay down our anger. We lay down our offense. We lay down our hurt and our disappointment. And we say, God, search me. Help me in the areas of my life to be humble, to be kind, to serve, to forgive, and to love unconditionally. You do that, watch what God does with the people around you, through you. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you, God, that you're doing a work in our hearts. None of us have arrived, none of us, certainly not me. But I'm, I'm so thankful, God, for your patience, your love, and your care for each one of us. Help us, God, to be the light that you've called us to be, that people would look at the way that we live and the way that we love and the way that we show compassion and they see a glimpse, just a glimpse of who you are. Do that work in our hearts today, I pray. With every head bowed, every eye closed before we dismiss. If you're here today, maybe you've heard this message and you don't personally know God. You don't personally have a relationship with him. He came for you. God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. But it's up to you to receive the free gift of salvation that Jesus Christ came, gave his life for so that you might have life and you might know true forgiveness. If you're here today, I'm not gonna call you out or embarrass you, but when I count to three, 
If you want that today, you want to be included in this final prayer, when I count to three, will you just raise your hand, look at me? No one's looking around. It's just between me, you, and God. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I see your hand in yours. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I pray, God, that you would just renew our hearts and our minds today. Draw us close to you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, can, can we pray together for the sake of those that raise their hand? Just repeat this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. You gave me unconditional love. Help me to love unconditionally. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart today. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord, my Savior, my God, and truly my best friend. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, God bless you, church. I love you so much. Happy Father's Day. Make sure you get your stuff in the lobby. Have a wonderful week. I love you guys. And happy Father's Day to you, Pastor Glenn. You appreciate our pastor. He is a good man. Would you stand now to receive a blessing? And as the altar prayer team comes up to the front, I wanna encourage you that if you raise your hand to receive Jesus, after we dismiss in just a moment, come up to the front and see one of our altar prayer team members because we have a free gift that we would like to give you. It's this book to really help you on this journey in your life. So to receive your blessing now, if you would just open your hearts, maybe turn your palms upward in an attitude of receiving. I wanna give you a father's blessing. Now, many of you have had amazing fathers who have blessed you many times, and some of you maybe never received a father's blessing. I want you to have that today. May you be blessed in everything that you do and every word that you speak. May you be blessed in the influence that you have on people around you and to create a legacy of love and grace in your life. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, church, and happy Father's Day, dads. <laughs>